You're listening to The Vint Podcast, bringing you expert interviews, alternative market insights, and exclusive access to the world of wine and spirits investing. Enjoy the show. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of The Vint Podcast. I'm joined once again in studio by Billy Galenko. Billy, how are you doing? Pretty well. Cannot complain. Are you heads down studying? Yeah. Yeah. For the past few weeks, I have my diploma number three exam for the WSET diploma thing. It's a six-part process like we've mentioned, and this is, yeah, wines of the world. It's just on every dry or sweet wine in the world, just excluding fortified and sparkling. So it's been a lot, a lot of tasting. Our fridge is now full of wine, (laughs) which my girlfriends luckily let me have or take over the whole fridge, I guess. But yeah, it's been great. And I think we're going to have a a little get together this weekend to drink all of the open bottles so I don't have to pour them down the drain. Nice. How long is the actual exam? It's a two-day exam. There's a a two-parter. I think it's an hour and a half each paper or maybe maybe more on um, theory one day. And then the next day is a two-parter, 12 blind wines. So the the first, it's broken into two. So the first one is identifying the, the grape for three of the wines and then the re- uh, the country for three of the wines. And then the second half is identify the region for three of the wines and then a grab bag where you're supposed to kind of sure. taste through the wines and also just say what you, what you think it is. Do you like the tasting or the writing best? I mean, I know you like writing a lot, but what, what feels most natural to do? I like them both at this point. Like it's been nice. Cause I'm, I'm, had enough experience with enough wines of the world where I trust my palate. So when I taste the wine and go through like, what I'm seeing, it's that's pretty easy. I would say the identifying the specific region or varietal may be tough depending on what they are, just because of now I have tasted so many. So my like my Rolodex is enormous and I my mind might go to some obscure Italian wine. It's like, no, it's it's probably not that, but it could yeah. be. Yeah, you're um, in that you're in that nose too much phase right now because you've been cramming everything and you have too much to pull from. Or just the weird stuff that I drink on a regular basis. I think that's <laughs> yeah. like if, if I just drink normal wines all the time, it wouldn't be so yeah. so difficult. But yeah, so I'll keep you guys posted on how that goes. And then we'll hear in quarter of a year if I pass. <laughs> Very good. It'll be so, episode 200 by the time <laughs> Billy finds out. Oh, yeah. Well, well, we don't have too many platform updates today. You know, as we get into the episode, we have two open collections right now, Billy, our Bordeaux Millennium Collection and our Bordeaux On For More 2021 Collection, which has been open for some time. And we had a lot of fanfare and comments around. These are two awesome Bordeaux collections. Do you want to tell the audience just once again, maybe three sentences on what distinguishes these collections and, you know, why they may be unique? Yeah, I, th- I think the On For collections, it's a good time to talk about it because Harvest is is kind of underway wrapping up already in some parts of Bordeaux as we talk about with Lisa our guest coming up but what's interesting there is we worked through all of the available wines from the 2021 vintage and found as much value as we we could to offer a really unique investment opportunity and again the value of entrepreneur kind of comes from one we're buying wines that are still in the barrel so when they're released there's a whole process and a standard, you know, kind of a traditional step change that you see over the years in terms of price. So we're getting in at the the bottom possible level there. And we had a lot of judicious buying and got great allocations this year. So that on premier collection is is really exciting. And then to balance that, we now have a back vintage collection open of 2000 Bordeaux, which is one of the best vintages of the past 30 plus years. We have some of the top names, some of the top first gross, as well as top names from the right bank. So it's really a perfect kind of the two values you're looking for in Bordeaux, the, the traditional step changes are one, when they're released, two, younger wines as they start to kind of disseminate through the market, and then three, when they reach their drinking window. And these 2,000 wines are are starting to reach kind of the, the prime beginning of their drinking window, and then they're going to be just like really great for collectors to be drinking soon. So yeah, it's a perfect balance to add both to your portfolio. Yeah, there we actually had this conversation with an investor on our platform last week, just about maybe the different ways that you can think about diversifying your wine portfolio, right? And I mean, you can think about diversity as Bordeaux versus Burgundy, but it could also be young Bordeaux versus like like you said, in that third stage, maybe drinking window Bordeaux. So there are a lot of ways that you can think about diversification and how the markets may change and changes in price over time. So yeah, I think it's it's a great opportunity to, to acquire blue chip assets from 
maybe the the blue chip region for investment wine. So we'll leave those collections on the platform to give folks something to really build a kind of a cornerstone in their portfolio with. So I think they're, they're two great collections to start with when you come to the Vint platform or even add to if you've been with us for some time. But we'll leave those collections up for a little bit. We do have a several collections in the pipeline, I think more than a dozen collections upcoming over this kind of as we head towards the end of the year. Um, so we're really excited. I think we have a lot of diversity. We have some regions we haven't featured before. There's more whiskey mixed in there. Yeah, I think a lot of opportunity to really build diversification if you're either just starting out with us or maybe don't have as much of maybe wines from outside of Bordeaux or Burgundy, which is, you know, the majority of what we see in the marketplace. So a lot of opportunity to expand your portfolio over the coming quarter, over this quarter, I guess. Yeah, yeah. To the end of Q4 2022. End of Q4, that's right. There's there's a bunch of, yeah, I, I... created the SEC docs and I'm working on the other materials now. And, and the more that, you know, I, I continue to dig in and just write about these wines. We, we had our in, investment theses before we, we purchased them, but, you know, just adding color for all of our materials, it's, it's going to be really exciting. And I, I think everybody's going to really enjoy, like Brady said, kind of being exposed to some new regions or producers that they, they may not have encountered before and learning about them. Yeah. And then, you know, we wanted to shorten the intro that we have on today's episode so we can leave a lot of space for our guest today, who is really special. We're extremely excited to have Lisa Prati Brown on the episode today and getting to interview her and 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 really dig into her background in the wine world. And maybe Billy, you can give a bit of an overview on Lisa and why it's so special that we have her joining today. Yeah. So Lisa was the uh, she's in the Master of Wine, number one. She was the editor-in-chief of The Wine Advocate. So basically, after Robert Parker sold his company and stepped down from actually doing reviews, he kind of stayed on and helped do reviews for an extended period. She became editor-in-chief at the at the new company. So basically, she took on over time the duties of reviewing Bordeaux and Napa and what, what was kind of Robert Parker's bread and butter. So for years, if you kept looking at Wine Advocate reviews, you're actually reading her reviews rather than Robert Parker after he had kind of stepped away from Bordeaux and and Napa. So she was hugely influential in in the wine world. And just in the last year, she, working with a a partner, kind of stepped aside and started her own project, which is not just a project, it's a company called The Wine Independent. So basically, she's taking everything that she learned from all the years working in wine prior to Wine Advocate at Wine Advocate and is basically taking all of her learnings to see how she could do it even even better in her you know in her own way and offer what she's viewing consumers as a really independent impartial kind of useful tool to identifying wines that they they like and enjoy so she goes into detail about what the wine independent is and her approach to tasting and and it's it's all really really interesting and i i think anybody who's been drinking wine or wants to learn how to kind of evaluate wine a little bit for their own enjoyment i think it's fascinating and she has a lot of comments about their their focus being on maintaining high ethical standard with this kind of this new venture and wine reviewing and any industry review platform should hold themselves to high ethical standards but she certainly has emphasized that with this project and she really is for the consumer and i think our listeners will hear in the episode just how kind and gener- generous and gen- genuine that you know she is and yeah we're really happy to have her on so yeah and I, I will add to what you have to say there is when most people think about like maybe some people say critics are just telling you what wines they like and other ones are you know using some some weird system she she makes a distinct point of she knows how to taste objectively and how to analyze wine and then she also has her own favorites so we get to hear a little bit about what she personally prefers but i i think it's great for people to understand that wine critics are not just telling you if they like the wine and they're not rating on their own scale there's actually a kind of an objective kind of a couple of things they're looking for, which she discusses. And and it's cool to kind of learn what goes into that 96 point score, 97, rather than just saying like, oh, she really likes it or she doesn't. So definitely stay tuned. It's a longer interview, but stay tuned. And she also has a great story with about Robert Parker and how she kind of first kind of started working with him at the end of the episode. So stay tuned and listen to the whole, whole thing to hear it. And here is Lisa Prady Brown. All right. I'd like to introduce a very special guest, former editor-in-chief of The Wine Advocate and now co-founder of The Wine Independent, Lisa Parati brown Thank you so much for joining the Vent Podcast. Thank you for having me. 
Yeah, of course. Yeah, luckily, Adam, our director of wine, also an MW, works with Lisa. So we were able to get the intro and we're <laughs> very excited, something we probably couldn't do otherwise. But yeah, could you just give the the listeners a little bit of your your background, maybe kind of how you kind of got into wine? I was reading that you were a playwright or an aspiring playwright at the time. That seems like yes. an Yes. Well, I did a degree in English literature and performing arts, and I I spent a year studying Shakespeare in London. And that was really kind of what brought me to London. I I completely fell in love with the place. I fell in love with the theater there, but also the whole scene that was going on. And this was in the late 80s and early 1990s. Kind of dates me a little. And I went back, finished my degree, and then got on uh, literally on a plane the day that I graduated and went straight back to London because I loved it so much. And I did do, you know, a bit of playwriting. I got, you know, a few plays produced on the fringe and and all of that. But I realized very quickly that playwriting doesn't actually pay very well. And I needed some kind of job to pay the rent. So a friend of mine happened to be managing a wine bar and said, oh, why don't you come and, and, you know, do a few shifts at the wine bar a week? And then he wound up leaving. I had the opportunity to take the job as manager of the wine bar. I completely blagged my way through the interview, (laughs) suggesting to the owners that I perhaps knew a little bit more about wine than I actually did. You know, I I think that's where my acting talents actually came into effect there because I I somehow managed to get the job, but then I had to learn about wine to keep the job. So I I quickly signed up for WSET classes and then the the rest is kind of history. I wound up going through all of the the WSET levels and got my diploma and then signed up for the Master of Wine. And that was a whole other story. And then wound up working in just about every job out there in the wine trade. I I went to to work for a little while for Corny and Barrel Wine Merchants in London, which have the agent for Petrus or had the agency for Petrus back when it was being sold through agents and Domaine de, Rome, de la Romani Conti, Salon Champagne. So I got exposure to some really top level wines at a young age. And that was just when I was starting out on my MW journey. So that was wonderful experience. At that time, I was doing sales and sale on trade sales and also looking after their group of 13 wine bars. Then I, you know, did a little bit of time working for a subsidiary of LVMH, selling and doing marketing for Vopclico and Krug in London, and then wound up going to Tokyo. Lived in Tokyo for nearly five years, working mainly as a, a wine buyer for a wine importer there, but also did some wine education there, working at the Academy de Van and Aoyama, and then wound up going to Singapore. By that time, I'd met Robert Parker in Japan, of all places. And he offered me a position, uh, first writing a blog piece about the wine scene in Asia for the website. And then soon I was reviewing the wines of Australia and New Zealand. And then eventually he sold the wine advocate to a group of Singaporean shareholders. And I became the editor in chief and started looking after other regions Napa, Bordeaux, eventually California Central Coast. I did Oregon for a little while. So Kind of, I've done a lot. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> and that mm-hmm. that about summarizes it. I think that that's the the three minute tour of my my entire wine career. And Lisa, before that, you came up in Maine, right? In like rural Maine. Oh my God, yes. I I grew up in Maine. <laughs> was that was was that yeah. supposed to be expunged from that the was, records? <laughs> yeah, that, that, that was you know pre wine life. That well, in fact, right. I, I I went to college in Maine as well. I went to Colby College in Maine. Okay. I you know honestly, my my only experience you know up until I, I went to London with wine was Boone's Farm apple wine, maybe a little tip yeah. of pink, but I don't think that those even qualify as wine. So <laughs> there, there was no wine that featured in my formative years, no. Yeah, I, I grew up in rural Maryland and it was, it's, you know, it's very similar. You get into West Virginia and these regions and it's all fruit wines and, and stuff like that. But we we spoke with master of wine, David Keck, who's making wine in Vermont. We thought, oh, well, we can just keep going farther north and maybe there are some interesting wine stories out of Maine as well. But I'm, I'm sure Maine and your experience or uh, as maybe you've come back, the experience of wine in Maine is very different than London and Tokyo and, and Napa. Yeah, yeah. given given the, the extreme winters, and I mean, the, the winters can be pretty extreme in Maine, 
I don't think that a sniffer or any other grape variety would yeah. survive for very long. You know, even the American species would probably be challenged there. Right. Yeah, they'd have um, to have to bury them under so much dirt. To <laughs> yeah, that's right. them. Yes. <laughs> that's <laughs> bulldoze them. <laughs> can you can you can you talk can you talk a little bit about your MW process and you so you started with W set and I'm you know I don't know. I mean, Billy's in this process a little bit farther along than I am, especially towards diploma and stuff like that. But how has that that scene changed from when you were going through WSET and eventually did the Master of Wine to now? Are you still involved in WSET programming? No, no, I do. I coach people from time to time, you know, just okay. out of, you know, uh, love of wine and love of education. So if they happen to be going through WSET, but but. Having said that, I don't do anything formally education-wise really at all now, except for donating my time to the, the Institute of Masters of Wine. I now operate as a paper chair for the practical side, the, the tasting side of the exam, which means that I help to put the papers together each year and I oversee a team of examiners working on one of the papers. And, you know, that, that's been fantastic. I've been, before that, I was an examiner, examiner for a number of years, and now I've come on board as the paper chair. But it's, it's a, an incredible process, I think. And I really strongly believe in what we do at the, Mas at the Institute of Master of Wine, and that, you know, it, it, you know, improves every single year, even since I did the exam. In many ways, you know, we, we always say that the exam gets harder every year and it does because the wine world grows and, you know, you're expected to know more. But that said, I think that nowadays we're so much more transparent about the examination process and what you need to do and the standard you need to get to and what we're expecting on exam day, how to answer the questions. So it, it's so much clearer for students now more than ever. And there's so many resources available to students that I think that, you know, we, we do get a little bit better every year at, at letting people know the standard, because the standard is, is, as you know, very, very high, mm -hmm. uh, the standard that they need to get to before they even think about applying to go into the program, but then also before they even think about attempting to sit the exam for the first time. And, you know, so looking at the papers every single year, I see that we're getting better caliber of students who are more prepared when they sit down to do the exam and they do know what's expected of them. And that's wonderful. Nice. Yes. It sounds like it's, I mean, just based on the process, it's starting to become considered in level with a PhD. It's obviously in, you know, in terms of the amount of work and the rigor and these kinds of things, it has to be one of the top professional certifications in that sense. But I wonder, you know, if it will continue to grow to a point where it will be seen as a legitimate professional option for people coming maybe just out of college or even before college to say that's my end goal and not something maybe I think we hear from a lot of people they sort of stumble into this path right but it would be really cool when there's a day where people will say I'm not going to go for you know this PhD or this master's I'm going to go you know yeah. towards this master's. I, I totally agree or even an MBA I, I would say you know for a lot of professions in the wine industry you know, the master of wine is is actually, you know, what you should be looking for. And we, we know that because we can see more and more, for example, wine buyers for a major, well, <laughs> people like yourself, you know, because it gives you such a great grounding, not only in, you know, your tasting abilities, because more and more so what I like to emphasize when putting together exams is the importance of being able to recognize wine quality given no information about the wine. And that does not necessarily correlate with price. And that's something that I even, you know, have to remind examiners and, and people who are putting together the papers that, you know, we are, you know, getting closer and closer every year to aligning very clearly for students what wine, the elements of wine quality are and how to recognize those. And they're emphasized at the seminars that we do and everything that we do. But it's one of the greatest skills, I think, that, that as a taster you can have. And it's something that very much, you know, leads into our discussion about what I do, you know, which is as a wine critic, being able to, to look beyond, you know, what all of the, the brand marketing is and the label and, you know, the Grand Cru Casse levels and even the price tag and to say, okay, this is better than that. And, you know, when, when it all boils down to, you know, what, what's important with blind tasting skills, for me, that's the most important thing.
because very rarely in your your real life applications do you come across you know a situation where you have to sort of you know what the grape variety is or what the the producer right. is or the region and things like that and although it's important to be able to recognize the elements of those things it's probably more important for your everyday job to be able to recognize quality and so that that's something we're impressing upon students more and more yeah now i think and i think that would be a great transition into the wine independent but i i started my wine journey, kind of taking the, the quarter master sommelier exams on the side of my regular job, and then trying to explain to people what the difference is now that I've, I've switched, I'm partway through to the diploma, about to take my D3 exam. I've been trying to explain to people kind of what the difference is. And to your point, that aspect of quality in business is so heavily emphasized in the W set and then down the line with MW compared to really understanding more how to describe a wine and sell it in person and really like be able mm-hmm. to explain your list. It's very interesting. And I think that's very important too. We're, we're more and more focusing on style and describing style because it is important for just about any profession you do in the wine industry is being able to consistently and accurately describe a wine to somebody so that it's meaningful to them. And again, that, that brings us back to you know what I, I want to do more and more with the wine independent. I think that that's one of the areas where Wine criticism has perhaps failed us a little bit and that, you know, I think we can do things better for consumers. I think that we can help manage their expectations of a wine when they read a tasting note or even when they go through the filters on a website and they're looking for a specific style of wine. Because we we all have in our mind when we're looking, you know, to buy a new wine, a style that we want to, to drink. And, and I would even argue that oftentimes that style is more important than the quality even. You know, for example, you know, if you want red or white, you know, it, you know if, if you, you definitely want a white wine that night, you know, it doesn't matter how high scoring the red wine is over here, you're, you're not going to buy it because you, you're in the mood for a white wine. Maybe you're in the mood right. for Chardonnay or Riesling, you know, and that, that's what you want. So, you know, very clearly being able to explain to a consumer in the concisest possible way and in the simplest terms, you know, this is what you can expect when you buy this wine, that's going to service them so much more so than scores, which actually correlate more to the quality level of the wine. So I think that, you know, coming back to what you were saying about the the psalm world there there's so much that we can learn from and take from that both for you know the the master wine exam but also in the way that any of us speak to consumers because that's where you know we we failed them i think largely they look at you know a lot of tasting notes now and they're like well that means nothing to me or that correlates nothing to this wine that i'm drinking you said it was going to be medium bodied. And, you know, I'm looking at 16% alcohol, or, you know, a mouthful of tannins here, and it's pretty full bodied to me, you know, you just, you just, you know, <laughs> mis- misled me on this line. Mm-hmm. So I think that, you know, that sort of rigorous training, that's those sort of qualifications, when it comes to wine criticism, or anyone who's speaking to a consumer and describing a wine that they may or may not want to sell, that that's you know where we really need to focus nowadays as well. That makes sense. So before we hop right into the wine independent as why you started it, can we just cover off on the three elements you look for while you're you're tasting a wine and analyzing? You have you have style, mm-hmm. quality, and ripeness listed on the the site. You kind of touched on the first two, but maybe elaborate a little bit and then talk about what you mean by ripeness as well. Well, ripeness, I think you know. When we talk about ripeness, oftentimes people see it as a, as a kind of point on a graph, you know, and, and before that point, it's the, the, you know, fruit that went into the wine is underripe and, you know, above that point, it's overripe. And from what I see, it, it's, it's not necessarily a point, it's more like a band, you know, and this is, you know, where, you know, terroir has an impact, the climate has an impact, but also, you know, the winemaker's judgment largely has an impact because they have very little say over those those two other elements <laughs> that said you know you're working with a specific terroir or you know maybe you're you're choosing your fruit if you're, you're uh, you know buying in fruit every year and you're you're looking to put together a blend 
but you know those those two factors aside you know a winemaker every year you know decides you know this is what i want to express from this people piece of land and this vintage this is what's going to actually give the 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 drinker of the wine a great story that tells the stories of the place and of you know the time that it comes from the vintage that it comes from and also about the winemaker's interpretation of those two things and so you will have, you know, a ballad band of brightness, basically. And what I'm looking for, you know, is, is, you know, not the style of wine necessarily that I want to drink, because, you know, I have to put my own personal stylistic preferences aside when I'm assessing wine. I'm simply describing it accurately for a consumer and saying, you know, qualitatively where it sits for that style that I've just described. So maybe, you know, it's on the fresher style or maybe it's on the richer, more riper style of the, the spectrum. So you've got, you know, at, at one end, the sort of crunchier, brighter fruits. And at the other end, you've got, you know, the spicier, more fruit compote or, you know, fruit cake kind of aromas and flavors. And neither one is, is you know, necessarily good or bad because there's other elements that you're going to look at you know, in the context of the, the, the flavor expressions that you get at either ends of that ballet band of ripeness. And in a totally, you know, except that there you, you can go overblown, you know, and you've got, you know, full-blown raisins on one end of the spectrum and a limited amount of flavor compounds because flavor compounds actually develop like a bell curve you, at one end of the flavor at the ripeness spectrum. You have, you know, very few flavor compounds and when it's underripe, then they, they blossom, you know, and you get the full expression of them. And then at the other end, they start to deteriorate again. And so you just get this sort of jammy or raisiny character. But within the, the valid, you know, band of ripeness, you know, taking into account the acidity that, that is obviously linked and the sugar level that's, that's linked and the, you know, subsequent alcohol level all of these things, you know, I think that, that it's really a matter of describing the style and how well, you know, the, the winemaker actually, you know, nailed it in terms of bringing out the balance and obviously phenolic ripeness as well, so that you've got nice ripe, ripe tannins going with it and all. So, I mean, it, it's quite a complicated thing that, that a winemaker is, is actually doing out there. And we, we all appreciate that. But I think we all also have to appreciate that they have certain judgment calls and, and that there, you know, is that valid band of ripeness. So that, that's the thing that I'm trying to describe to people, because again, you get people who, you know, consumers who love that, that fresher, crunchier end of the spectrum. And you've got consumers who love the, the riper, richer end of the spectrum, maybe the spicier end of the spectrum. And being able to describe to them exactly accurately as possible what they're going to get, which has could have little to do. You can get, you know, at one end of the spectrum and the other end of the spectrum within that valid band, wines that have, you know, exactly the same score. The score is not going to tell you anything about the style of the wine. So being able to describe that, you know, rightness, and I, I think it's kind of part and parcel with the style and then where it sits quality, qualitatively for that style. I mean, you know, maybe the winemaker got the flavor compounds right, but they misjudge the acidity at, you know, either it's too tart or it's, you know, too flabby. So that that's a quality factor. It needs to be described in the style as well, but obviously it loses a few points if it's, it's not balanced, if it's not giving you a harmonious kind of seamless experience. And, and these are all things that, that I am there to describe and to judge as well. And I'm, you know, all I really want to be is, you know, sitting in that seat for the consumer, you know, and, and sort of saying to them, there you are, there's the information. You're not able to taste all of these wines that I, I've just tasted, but, you know, I'm not your palate. You know, I'm not going to tell you what to like and what not to like. What I'm going to do is describe the experience for you and tell you where it sits quality, qualitatively for that experience. Yeah, I love how the ripeness kind of brings it back to the fact that it is it, it is grown in the vineyard and everybody says like all the work goes in in the vineyard. Well, that's true. But balancing that out with the quality aspect, because 
if you're harvesting at a certain sugar level, sure, the wine may be there and you can adjust it in the winery, but then you balance that out with your quality analysis. And it's like, was this fruit perfect when it was coming in or did the winery kind of Frankenstein it into something they wanted it to be? Exactly, exactly. Or did they they nail it? You know, maybe they, they, you know, brought some of it in. And I see this, you know, it happens here in Napa. It's happening more and more in Bordeaux as as people are, are, you know, getting, you know, closer to that, that precision viticulture that everybody's kind of looking for right now. But you, you, some people will bring in some of the fruit earlier on. 2022 was a perfect example because it was a very hot, dry vintage. And so we saw, you know, some winemakers bringing in some fruit a little bit earlier to maintain a little freshness. But obviously what they want for most of it is the phenolic ripeness that they really need, particularly when you're working with Bordeaux varieties. And so, you know, they'll, they'll let the, the rest hang, but you know, what they've got is, you know, a, a nice layered effect with a little bit of brightness in there, giving the wine a little lift, but you know, the, the vintage is going to dictate, this is going to be a riper expression because you, you are going to have to let the fruit hang a little bit longer in order to get that phenolic ripeness. And so, yes, that, that's what we're looking for. That skill, you know, that, that, you know, ability to sort of judge, you know, what, how am I going to put this together and bring together something that's balanced, that has the night, the necessary amount of freshness that it needs, a little bit of brightness, the layers of flavor compounds in there that you get with, you know, something coming in at the fresh end and coming in at the riper end, all of that. So, and, and that that's fascinating to sort of take apart in the glass as well. That's why I love the job. <laughs> it's really the main decision point, right? For winemakers, I'd imagine when to pick. It is. Absolutely. There's, 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 there's not a lot afterwards that. <laughs> you know, I hate coming during harvest and, and coming around almost like to, you like to bug them <laughs> right. because I know how focused they need to be. Furrowed brow. You know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, exactly. I mean, it's, it's, they need to be super focused because, you know, they have one chance to get it right every year, you know, and I think apart from, you know, obviously you, there are a lot of viticultural decisions that you need to make during the growing season, but the number one thing that's going to impact the style and the quality of the wine is the harvest dates and decisions. And, and, you know, they, it's, it's like, you know, this big puzzle that's in, in the winemaker's head and they have to put it together and then you know, there's the logistics to think about as well. You know, you don't even want to think about that, you know, between juggling tanks and, you know, getting the, the the pickers, you know, which becomes more and more difficult every year, getting harvest teams together and mobilizing them at the right time in the right place and, you know, making sure everybody's doing what they need to because the parameters change every single year. It must, it must, you know, put, put some people, winemakers over the edge you know sometimes yeah, yeah for sure now, I, I've worked for a couple of producers and they, they pick more mechanically but yeah I, I can't imagine having to have your team just ready to pick at any time of the night you know any day so mm -hmm. or any time of the early morning yeah th there's so many complex kind of objective variables that you need to understand that go into making a good wine but let's kind of narrow in on why you called it the wine independent and then kind of like obviously we're funneling that through you so that everybody else doesn't have to understand all the variables. We're able just to succinctly explain it. So can you kind of talk about why you guys started and why you chose the name Wine Independent? Yeah, well, the Wine Independent, we just kind of wanted to put it out there. It's just a simple statement of, you know, what our, our core ethos is. You know, we're absolutely independent. We don't take any money from any wineries or wine-related entities. We pay our own way when we go on, on trips. You know, the, the usual stuff. It's basically the, the core of what Robert Parker started out doing when he started the Wine Advocate in 1978. So, it, you know, it's, it's really, there's not a lot to talk about there. <laughs> I feel like it's some, a point that's been overtalked. But, you know, in the background, I suppose there is, you know, some things to consider because, you know, more and more publications look for ways of, of you know, monetizing wine criticism that, that, you know, goes outside of, you know, maybe those ethical considerations. So, yeah, I think it, it needs to be said. And we just, you know, put it in the title. <laughs> we'll say there, boom, it's been said. 
uh, that this is what we're doing and we're, we're not compromising on that. One of the things that, you know, Johan and I wanted first and foremost, when we, we started up a publication, it was, you know, one of the, the, the simple factors that made me want to make the move was that we do have complete control over the company. We have the voting rights when it comes to decisions so that you no know, shareholders can ever pressure us into doing things that we don't think that are ethically right for the company. You know, our, our expectations of, you know, how to monetize the company and how to make a profit are reasonable and, and modest. And so, you know, we're, we're never looking, you know, to turn this into a, a billion dollar operation or to, to flip it you know, to make a lot of money. That, that's not, you know, what kind of publication we are. We really want to service the consumer as best we can and as honestly we can and do what we both love. You know, he's, you know, spent his entire life as well, working life, I should say, his career as a photojournalist and, you know, moved into photographing wine regions in the, the you know, early 2000s and, you know, just has a passion for it. He wouldn't call himself a wine expert per se, but he's, Johan's got a very good palate. <laughs> and we have a lot of arguments in the car after we leave the winery. But, uh, and that, that, <laughs> that's fun. <laughs> but, you know, and, and you, you, the other thing is having total creative freedom to do what we want to do, to do visual storytelling, to, you know, actually invest, you know, a good portion of, of the money that we have into the visual side. I mean, most people are, you know, a, a lot of wine criticism publications are about notes, 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 notes. And, you know, I, I just call them note dumps. You know, they just like dump, you know, thousands of, you know, notes in every year. And they say, you know, that that's how they're servicing the consumer. And, and you know, that has its positives as well. And we, we're, you know, do want to build a large database but we want to have the storytelling behind it as well, because when people are looking to invest, you know, a lot of money in wine and they're, they're, you know, bringing these wines into their cellars or, you know, maybe they don't even have a cellar, but they're, they're spending an awful lot on a, a bottle of wine to have on a special occasion. They really want a little bit more behind the wine, you know, the story behind the wine and maybe some visual images, you know, to go with that as well. We're all operating so visually now because of social media. So that, that was very important to us as well. And I wanted to be able to, to tell a, a lot more of the stories. They don't have to be long stories. A lot of the stories that I write each week are, are you know, between 600 to 1,200 words. So they're not very long. They're just, you know, what I see is like maybe a story that, that nobody else has told about this winery. If it's a famous one, or maybe it's a new winery that nobody's heard of before. And so they need a little bit more of that information. And then, you know, you get the, the beautiful photography that goes with it. So that's, that's really what we're about. But yeah. at the core of it, what I really wanted to do was build a superior database with superior search functionality on the website. So we added some new filters that I think are very important to consumers today, including alcohol level, which, you know, it takes a, a bit of effort extra effort to ask for to find the alcohol levels of all of the wines but you know I, I try to for every single wine at least have what's written on the bottle which would give the consumer the same experience that they would have if they were picking up the bottle in a shop and looking at it at least I know that that can not be the most accurate information but it's close or if even better if I'm sitting there with a winemaker then I'll get the technical details of that the other thing is expertly judged body level. And I, I did put a description on the website about what impacts body, which, you know, largely speaking is alcohol to a certain extent, but also dry extract, for example, tannins, anthocyanins, the, the color compounds, they give a sense of weight on the palate as well. Residual sugar certainly impacts the weight of the wine. So these things come together. And so when we were, for example, bringing on Susan, who does Italian wines for us now, I very clearly walked her through these, you know, and said, okay, we, you know, you need to professionally judge and do it consistently, consistently and accurately for each of the wines, whether it's light, light to medium, 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 full or full body. 
And this, again, just helps consumers to know what kind of wine they're buying, whether it's the experience that they want. The other thing that we do is, it used to frustrate me at, at Robert Parker Wine Advocate, was, and, and this was, you know, it's no fault of anything but the system. I guess when Robert Parker was first setting up the website, the, the first iteration of the website was set up in 2002. And he had the habit of often putting in blends, um, so proprietary blend, or Bordeaux blend, or Rome blend, or, you know, all of these blends. And so for a lot of the wines that are in that database, and everybody else's database, because let's face it, everybody else copied what he was doing, <laughs> that, that it just has like blend on there, one of those types of blends, but it doesn't say what the major grape variety is. And of course, the major grape variety impacts the style of lot. Oftentimes, if you're, you know, in Bordeaux, you will either are looking for a Cabernet Sauvignon type of experience or a Merlot experience, or more and more so, Cabernet Franc, which is starting to feature as the major grape and a lot of wines, particularly on the right bank. So you know what kind of experience you want because those, those grapes in and of themselves give very specific flavors, tannin type, you know, in terms of tannin texture, freshness, all of these things. So you know what you want to drink, but trying to find that information is, is very difficult. For example, a lot of, of wines in the Medoc are actually mainly Merlot, but you wouldn't know it because you just assume, oh, it's the Medoc, it's going to be mainly Cabernet Sauvignon. And then, you know, when you, you drink the wine, you're wondering, well, you know, why is this not, you know, screaming Cabernet to me? Well, because it's mainly Merlot. And so we're, what we do on our website is we have, we have to put in the major grape variety. So sometimes it takes research and, and behind the scenes, I have a editor is actually, if I, if I don't have that information to hand, I hand it over to them and say, can you get that information? Because it's very important that we have the major grape variety in for every single wine. And again, that helps to make that search experience just a little bit better. If you can search by not only color and, you know, dryness level and things, you know, we have all of the other filters that, that the, the other websites have, but, you know, these three additional search features, I think makes a big difference in being able to hone in on the style of wine that you want to drink and that you're looking to buy. Yeah, no, I think that's how I've been trying to tell a lot of my friends how to start asking about the wines they like. And I really like the, the body mixed with like the alcohol because more and more today people are looking for that that lower alcohol experience which is really interesting and I also I, I think the key varietal is something that people overlook a lot because I, I do think a lot of things that are labeled Bordeaux blend have like a lot of Merlot and whether it be a holdover from the sideways time even though a lot of my friends were young when sideways came out they they still are like I don't like Merlot and I'm like well a lot of what you drink is Merlot which is interesting and even for me, I come across wines that I, I expect to be some varietal. And I was just telling Brady the other day, I'm, I'm prepping for my exam and I, I just got a bottle of Priorat. It just said Priorat. I didn't really think to look at it. I'm like, cool, it's probably Garnacha and Carignan. I'll just taste it. And then I was tasting it and I was like, I know I know this is a little, like Priorat's supposed to be a little darker expression of Garnacha, but this is a little ridiculous. And I looked up the tasting notes and the first two varietals were Merlot and Syrah. And I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So yeah. it's like, could have, I could have done that beforehand, but yeah, it, it's really important. And people can start seeing that some of their favorite wines maybe have other grapes or, or things that they may yeah. not have thought of. So I think that's really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I mean, I'm more and more interested and this is, like I said, I, I put away aside my personal preferences when I'm reviewing wines, but I'm more and more interested in and tasting and drinking the Cabernet Franc based wines coming out of Bordeaux and particularly in the warmer vintages. They tend to have a, you know, a bit of freshness and all of that. And particularly, you know, when they're, they're grown on limestone, for example, when they, they, they maintain that freshness as well. So, yeah, I mean, just being able, I, I find it fascinating, you know, when I've done a big vintage like 2021, I did 2019, we're just working on at the moment, a 2015, 2016, 2017, and 2018 retrospectives. And just being able to filter and find, okay, which ones are Cabernet Franc based, you know, and, and you know, very quickly being able to hone in on, on those wines and, and find them and, and buy them, you know, it's, it's, 
it really, you know, is an empowering experience, I think, for, for people who are interested in, and, and they know what they love, you know, so. So how do you fit all these variables into a, a scale, like a hundred point scale? I know that's kind of like what people are used to, and you kind of probably have to work on it. I know Jancis has her 20, but how do you like hone in on what's the difference between a, you know, a hundred point wine or maybe like a 95 or a 90? Well, it's, it's a lot of it's just experience, you know, the experience of tasting a lot of wines. And so you have this mental wine library in your head of all of these wines that you've tasted, you know, and, and you've got this perspective of, of you know, everything that, that, that's gone before and everything that exists out there. And so, you know, it's, it's actually a very quick thing to do that one of the quickest, simplest things for me to do right now is to to nail a score on a wine and to do that consistently. I love it when I, you know, re-review a, a vintage or something like that. And I come back to look at my old review, which I never do beforehand. And, you know, the, either the, the scores are identical or they're within a point. And if they're not, then, you know, I, I, I go back and I go, oh, okay, either this, this wine's changed dramatically since I last tasted it. And that's, you know, something that you need to, to explain in the tasting note as well. Or, you know, maybe you, you called it wrong either then or now, you know, you have to question if, if one of the bottles was wrong. But, you know, being able to say where something sits, you know, in, in that score range, you know, 90 to 100 is, is a very simple thing for an experienced wine critic because it's something that you do all the time. It's, it's, you could do it in your sleep, you know, almost and say, boom, that's that. But really, I mean, when we get into the upper echelons of scores, say you're getting, you know, above 95 and all of that, I think, you know, what you the, below that, the, the experience that you're saying, you know, from 90 to 95, oh, oh, that, that, those are, you know, outstanding wines in, the, in and of their own right. You know, they have to have balance. They have to, you know, have, you know, nice, ripe tannins and they have to have, you know, great texture. They have to have all of the elements that you're looking for, you know, the, a certain amount of intensity, you know, expression, you know, and all of these things. But then when you get to those real upper echelons, you're looking for something that really excels, you know, and usually that has to do with a certain level of express, um, sorry, sorry, complexity or expressiveness that goes above and beyond what you normally see do that real wow experience I can't believe that this wine is doing that and and you know sometimes it's it's a very unique experience you know and and I used to add a pleasant one that you haven't experienced before and yet you know you're seeing place in in a way that you hadn't quite seen it before vintage in a quite way you hadn't quite seen it before so it's, it's, it's just, you know, that and a bit more. But usually for me, if I were to just put it into simple terms, it would be complexity. It just has a little bit more in terms of those layers, that expression. And sometimes it's, it's not ready to drink yet. Sometimes they're so tight knit and you really, you know, you're, you're sort of like really focused on looking for them, but you can, you can see them and they're all, you know, tightly layered and you know, it's going to blossom, you know, given a few years in bottle, you can, because uh, that that's your experience with wine. That's what you're you're basing your judgment on. That that note on complexity is is that a reason why it's harder to find? You know, just say like a, a lighter bodied white wine above ninety five points, maybe, or getting higher scores than you might see some of the more expressive varieties, maybe like well, Pinot it's, Noir. It's, and, yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. And there's some great varieties that it's easier for them to achieve that than others. Um, you know, Cabernet Sauvignon. Pinot Noir, is, it can be a little bit difficult because, you know, at, at, at it, it's much fussier um, in terms sure. of that ripeness band that I was talking about before. You know, Cabernet and Syrah have a much broader ripeness band. Pinot Noir is a very narrow one and you either have to nail it or you don't. <laughs> you know, if you don't nail it, then it, it's mm -hmm. either, you know, overblown and jammy, you know, on, on one side of that, that ripeness band, or it's just like, you know, lean, mean, and green on the other side and, it, you, know, it, you know, no fun at all. So it's, it's really difficult for Pinot Noir, but yeah, I, and, you know, coming to that old argument, well, why doesn't Burgundy have more hundred point wines, you know, like Bordeaux? 
Well, that would be my argument exactly. It's a fussy, fussy grape Pinot Noir, and it's really hard to to. It's it's a smaller target that you're trying to aim for <laughs> in the vineyard and in the growing season. You know, to get Pinot, you know, beautifully, perfectly ripe. Whereas Cabernet is a lot more forgiving. Merlot is, you know, all of there's there's varieties, and you know, I would even argue with white varieties, it's even tougher. Chardonnay for me is is a grape that almost behaves like a red variety, and I'm probably not the first first person to say that, but it because it's got that extra element of texture that a lot of white varieties don't have, and it's true that a lot of that texture is built in with the winemaking, but the fact of the matter is that Chardonnay really lends itself to that style of winemaking, you know, the least contact and, and barrel fermentation and all of that. It, it really works well with Chardonnay. And so you have that extra element, you know, and, and we, we shouldn't ever, we, we talk a lot about, you know, complexity being flavor compounds, but it, it also has a lot to do with texture and whether it's tannin texture or that, that satiny silkiness that you can get with, with Chardonnay. You can get it with sweet wines as well. I mean, again, they've got a little bit of an advantage over dry white wine. Um, right, but right. yes, I mean, you're absolutely right. Certain grape varieties, you know, with, with Sauvignon Blanc, for example, it, it's not impossible to get a hundred point wine with a Sauvignon Blanc, but it's more difficult because it tends to, you know, narrow itself into a much a smaller band of, of aroma and flavor compounds. And you really have to work hard to get something more complex out of it and to bring in things like texture to that grape variety. But you can do it, but it's it's not typical <laughs> and it doesn't naturally lend itself to that. So, but it's, it's a good point. Just a quick side on, on that, since we're talking about Pinot Noir and Sauvignon Blanc at the same time, what was it like tasting... I guess in New Zealand in the in the late '90s, I guess early 2000s, I guess you said it was. Oh uh, well, yeah, no, it was the mid 2000s. Yeah, mid 2000s. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so they were a little further along in terms yeah. of, but mm-hmm. I, I feel like Central Otago was only really kind of coming into its own. Were you finding just gems that nobody else in the world really knew about in terms absolutely, of like absolutely, yeah, absolutely, and and you know, it, it's largely because they, you know they they it took some time for them to find their way. I mean. Really, commercial winemaking in New Zealand didn't even take off until the mid 1980s, mm-hmm. you know, which is you know astonishing when you think how far they've come in such a short period of time. But you know they've got ideal climate, they've got ideal terroir, you know, even in in areas of Canterbury, they've got you know limestone, they've got you know beautiful, and and so many different areas where they can make you know extraordinary Pinot Noirs really great Chardonnays as well, and seriously interesting Sauvignon Blancs. But, you know, obviously they're almost a victim of their own success as well, because when you look what happened with this avalanche, <laughs> Marlborough and, you know, the, the, the vast, you know, amounts of, of, you know, really quite ordinary Sauvignon Blanc that, that's coming out, you know, oftentimes the greatness of what New Zealand can produce gets lost, you know, in that, that whole image. But yeah, that there's some extraordinary wines. And I loved touring New, Ze- New Zealand at that time for that reason, because there were so many discoveries to be made, you know, people who had just such passion, you know, and really were going out there, you know, to find, I'm thinking of Bell Hill, you know, where they really went to, they had to find limestone and all of their friends were down in central Otago and they're like no you know this is the spot this is the spot and that's where we're going to go and it's in the middle of nowhere but we're going to live here and we're going to make great you know and they did you know it's 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 extraordinary some of the the efforts and lengths that people went to in New Zealand and still do to make really really great wine maybe obviously a less remote region but I'm kind of on this journey to discover what's the like what's the middle ground in Napa Valley between You know, some people will turn their nose up and say too expensive, too extracted, too singular in style, especially Napa Cabernet. Um, Mm -hmm. And you spend time writing and reviewing and you're now living in Napa. What are the most interesting things happening in that region in terms of either maybe something happening in the vineyards or in the winery? 
maybe it's region or the sub ABAs that aren't getting as much exposure. What things are happening there that you think are interesting in moving that region forward? It's in our it's in our backyard, so I think that yeah. <laughs> folks should be more more well informed about it. It is Napa literally my offer. backyard. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. It's not really my backyard. It's <laughs> Yeah, no, it, they, there is so much exciting innovation going on in Napa, but a lot of people, you know, they have this idea of what Napa Cabernet is, and, and that still exists, you know, the, the great Napa blend, maybe, or, you know, the, the, the typical, you know, Napa Alley floor, and we've got so many, you know, famous vineyards that, you know, still produce a particular style, Tokalon, for example, Dr. Crane. So that that still exists, but what also exists and and you know is is I think very exciting is creative freedom here. There's a, a lot more winemakers who are feeling you know empowered by consumers to go out and forge a different style of Napa. And I'm not saying you know they're they're forcing the terroir to do something. It's not they're not no. But when you you go into the mountains, we all know that that you know that the mountains produce very particular style and and in the old days it was it was termed as rustic and rugged and all of these things and that's why people didn't you know go there first but you know people are are understanding much better now how to manage you know the tannins coming from the the whether it's Mount Veeder or Howl Mountain or so we're getting you know much better expressions from these places and much more unique and singular expressions they're not trying to be valley floor they they are their mm-hmm. own thing you know we we see you know Pritchard Hill you know for example is is many different sides of Pritchard Hill and many different expressions of Pritchard Hill and they're they're you know all equally beautiful I love you know that that Coombsville you know is is cool now <laughs> you know cooler climate you know Napa Cabernet is is becoming you know something that that's, you know, really sought after that people, you know, there are those that really love that style. I do. I, th- I think, you know, some of the, the cooler climate Napa cabs that are being produced are extraordinary. And, you know, people, I think, are trying to forge some value or better value ones so that it's not all, you know, crazy over $300 a bottle price points here. The problem is it's a small region and it's a very delimited and it's not going to get any bigger. And as you know, there's, you know, restrictions with planting and the hillsides and, you know, so, I mean, there's very few new areas that can be planted. I see, I live in Carneros. I see, you know, there's, there's some more plantings that are happening around here. And that's great because this is a great cooler climate area. And, you know, we're seeing with, you know, viticulture and with, you know, warmer vintages that we're getting, you know, you can consider planting things like Merlot and, and Cabernet Franc, certainly. And in some areas, even Cabernet Sauvignon, you're not going to get the same style that you get in Calistoga, <laughs> no, <laughs> but you will get, you know, uh, its own style. And, and that's what I love to see people exploring. I love that, you know, winemakers more and more so you know, I've never, uh, although there are some very good Pinot Noirs that are, are produced here in Carneros, I'm seeing more and more people kind of move away from the, the Pinot Noirs and experiment with other grape varieties, which I think, you know, largely, particularly given some of the warmer vintages that we've been having are, are probably the way forward. But, you know, there are some very cool areas still here in Carneros where, you know, they do p- produce really lovely Pinot Noir and especially Chardonnay. Wow. Uh, I'm really impressed with the, the Chardonnays that are, are coming from around here in Carneros. It, it, just getting a, a bit smarter with the, the winemaking, I think, because the, the potential for the fruit you know, always been here. But yeah, I think that the, the, the answer is that the Napa is, is probably a, a victim of its own image, but is, is breaking out of that Im- image and, and branching out into lots of different styles and expressions that I'm really excited about. And, you know, that, that you know, I get to, to discover again and again and again. And, you know, there, there are new winemakers coming here. It becomes more and more difficult. But, you know, we have to sort of, you know, say, okay, it's not happening everywhere here. But you're seeing, you know, a lot of big companies buying in. A lot of the traditional family managed wineries are being sold. And, you know, and, and that's, 
difficult for people who have loved Napa for a long time sometimes to accept. But, you know, with change comes opportunities to embrace change. And, and we'll see what, you know, all of those players are going to do. Hopefully make Napa more accessible to people, you know, for a long time. It's, it's some of the great, great wines of Napa have been largely inaccessible, either because of price tag or, you know, tight mailing lists that people can't get on. And, you know, although they can buy them in restaurants, oh, my God. I mean, who's going to pay those kind of prices yeah. in a restaurant? So it's 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 been tough, you know, to for I think young consumers or people, you know, wanting to learn about Napa to access some of the great great names that they hear about that are just you know way out of you know anyone's <laughs> price price band. So we'll see, but I, I think it is exciting days here in Napa. There is there's a lot of you know young winemakers that are are you know, starting to, to make their marks here. There's still some, some new areas that are being discovered and it's, it's fun. I, every year I, I continue to be surprised and I hope the day never comes that I'm not. Awesome. Well, I don't want to hold you for too long. I have a, a couple more quick questions. I would just say on the, on the note of vintage, maybe I guess since you're in Napa, how's the Napa vintage looking and is there anywhere around the world that you're hearing particularly good things about 2022? Yeah, well, Napa, I think we, we are having uh, well, most of the fruit, all of the fruits in, I think, <laughs> by now here in Napa. We had that little blip of a heat wave, as you know, during Labor Day weekend again. Oh, my God, it's becoming such a thing. I think people managed it well this year. I'm not hearing you know too many horror stories about that. Obviously, people lost some fruit weight during that, that period, but they're getting better and better here at, at first of all, anticipating that you can get caught out, you know, particularly at the, the, towards the end of the growing season with those heat spells and how to deal with them, whether, you know, it's with shade cloths, misters, smart use of water management and all of these things. So I think that that probably got away with it largely. Otherwise here in Napa, it's been a quite a a moderate vintage. It, we haven't had a lot of heat during the growing season. So it was a slower developing, which is nice. You know, it means that, you know, the, the, the berries will, when they've got that longer, cooler growing season, generally speaking, it gives them an opportunity to evolve a lot more flavor compounds with the sugar ripeness, you know, not, not overtaking the flavor and phenolic ripeness. In Bordeaux, I was also there at, at, at harvest time during that period. It was the Medoc was harvesting Merlots and most of the right bank had come in. Maybe three quarters of the right bank had come in because of Merlots. They were waiting on the Cabernets, Cabernet Francs and the Cabernet Sauvignons. They were starting to come in as I was there. They've had a very different growing season. It's been hot, 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 you know, pretty much all the way through. I was there in June and July as well. It was hot. I came back in September. It was still hot. <laughs> and of course, they had the fires. I don't think that they had much impact, if any, from smoke. I don't think it's going to be an issue. The, the fires were far enough to the south. If anything, I'll, I'll be looking for in areas like the Sac de Leonian. But like I said, I haven't heard tell of anyone having any issues with it. While I was in the Medoc, there was a fire that was happening over towards the coast that blew a couple of days towards the, the Medoc. The smoke blew towards the Medoc, but it was really strange because it, it would come at night on two nights and then it would just blow off from the ocean breezes come morning. So I don't think there was any impact from that either. The, the bigger impact will be the heat. There were on a lot of the, the deep gravels, sandy soils as well. The, the vines were struggling. The, it was hot and it was also very, very dry. Everybody kept praying for rain and it just never came. So yeah, there will be probably some impact, certainly, definitely impact the crop size. So you'll have, you know, smaller crops, largely due to dehydration. But that said, what I saw coming in and what I tasted coming in looked really, really good. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, they were bringing in, you know, picking bins full of raisins. They weren't. The, the, the grapes looked good. They looked healthy. The bunches were small. 
you know, the, the flavors, you know, were great, you know, the tannins look great. So I think it's going to be a great vintage. It'll probably be a, a smaller vintage, but, you know, there might be some issues on those real free draining soils that didn't have access to any water, particularly on younger vines. And that's what I could see just driving around. Younger vines were really impacted because they didn't have the root systems and the, the buildup of carbohydrates in the trunks to be able to withstand those long dry periods. But, you know, I think, I think, you know, there'll be a lot of really great wines coming out. People were reporting the alcohol levels didn't seem too excessive either, which was, Mm. you know, a really nice attribute. So we'll see some, some of the Merlot alcohols on the right bank actually were looking a little high, but for the most part, not probably as high as 2018, probably somewhere between 18 and 19. Hmm. Yeah, that'll be interesting. It's interesting. There's the only parallel the last year is the yields are down. Otherwise, I'm sure the wines are going to be so Mm. different from last year. It's going to be interesting back to back. So, oh, well, I wouldn't even compare it to 2021. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, it's going to be like night and I know, I know, I know. Both, you know, both ends of the spectrum of what you can get. (laughs) Awesome. Well, I guess we'll wrap it up. We've already been about an hour. So uh, our final question I would say is, uh, actually, I'm going to pivot from what our, we had in the, our little pre-notes with you is, do you have any in- interesting story that really stands out to you about your days working with Robert Parker? And we had Bartholomew Broadvent on recently, and he had a random story with Robert Parker and Julia Child, where he was on a panel tasting at Aspen. And they were talking about a Madeira pairing. They were just talking about Madeira in general. And apparently Julia Child insisted they had bananas to pair with the Madeira. He, he kind of went through this whole imitation of Julia Child and they they <laughs> they got on the panel and the co-people were like, why do we have bananas? And he's like, oh, Julia, tell them why we have bananas. And she's like, I can't remember. So <laughs> that that is how he ended oh, his I interview. Love Julia you should listen to that episode just the last like minute to hear his imitation, though. It was like spot on. I, I didn't want to try to do a Julia Child imitation. So yeah, um, she was wonderful, wasn't she? <laughs> but is there anything that kind of stands out as a, a unique story or stories that like people, a different side of Robert Parker that most people don't know about? Yeah, I mean, so many stories. But, you know, uh, the first time I met Robert Parker, I was I was living in Japan and I was helping to organize some events he was going to do coming to Japan. And one of the events he was doing was speaking to some Japanese winemakers who were making koshu the Japanese, it's not a Japanese indigenous grape so much, but it doesn't exist anywhere else in the world anymore. It's it's mainly vinifera. But, you know, he was sort of talking to them and he was leading a tasting of white grape varieties, dry white grapes, um, varieties, wines that didn't have any new oak because this is the way that they were, you know, looking to to make koshu and some great examples of, of wines of this style to sort of give them a little bit of inspiration about, you know, where they could look to go with, with, you know, the styles of Koshu that they were making. And so Bob kind of largely left it to me. And I should say uh, at that stage, it was Mr. Parker. <laughs> Cause I was just so nervous. I'd never <laughs> met him before. Actually, he hadn't even come to Japan yet when I was organizing this tasting for him and the, the wines that he would show. And so I I just spoken to him on the phone a couple of times and, you know, it was, you know, emails, but mostly faxes back and forth back in those days. And so eventually I kind of put together a list of, you know, dry Rieslings and Sauvignon Blancs and, you know, I think Suave and, you know, there there were all of these, you know, different, you know, wines that I had in my mind. And at the time I was doing my master of wine. So I was kind of, you know, geeky about all of these, these different styles and grape varieties and wines that we could do. And he largely left it up to me just to put the wines together. And then he would lead the tasting for them and talk about the wines. And we, we sat down, you know, he was about to start doing the tasting. And he calls me over and he goes, what is this one wine doing on here? And I was like, you know, I wanted to die. <laughs> I was like, what? The, the wine happened to be the Tyrrells, that one, Semyon. Mm. And I was like, well, you know, it's one of those great dry white wines of the world, you know, that, that, you know, that doesn't see any new oak. And he was like, I hate this style. I hate it. I mean, it's <laughs> terrible. What am I going to say about it? And I was like, oh, and he said, I'll tell you what, 
you sit up here on the panel with me and you talk about that one. <laughs> I was like, oh no. And so, uh, you know, it got, it got to me and I, I you know, I, I love Carol's that one. I love, I love Hunter Valley Simeon. And so, you know, I talk about the wine and take people through, you know, what I'm seeing in the wine and all of these things. And, you know, he was, he was very, very quiet. He didn't say anything. And he let me speak about the wine. And then he moved on with the other wines in the tasting. And then afterwards, he said, he spoke really well about that wine. He said, you know, it's a style I don't get, but, you know, I, I really appreciate, you know, what, what you said. And, you know, I, I thought it was very good. And, you know, I, at that time, I thought I'd blown it with him that, you know, I would never, ever get another call from him to do any other work with him ever again. But to his credit, you know, he did. He, he, he really, you know, valued my opinion right from that very, you know, first day. And, you know, that that was kind of what led me to to know that I could work with him because he was so deferential like that and he could be very humble and gracious and accepting of other people's views he's always said the greatest palate is your own and he he believes that you know he believes that he works for consumers and that has always you know been my inspiration you know and he's always been a mentor to me because of that wow that's my story <laughs> Yeah, that, that's, that's an awesome great story. story. No impression, but a great story. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah, well, no, you... I didn't give the impression to Bob Parker. No. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for the time. I think we're, we will leave it there, but we really appreciate it. And thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thank you thanks so much, Lisa. My pleasure. All right. That was our interview with Lisa Parati Brown. I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. For now, until next week, go check out our two open collections, the Bordeaux Millennium Collection, as well as the Bordeaux EP21. And yeah, we'll talk to you next week. Have a great week. To check out our current offerings and to sign up for the Vint platform, find us at www.vint.co. That's www.vint.co. For questions, comments, or feedback on the Vint podcast, please email us at support at vint.co. Vint and VV Markets are offering securities pursuant to Regulation A. Our offering circular as amended can be found on the SEC website. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Investments such as those on the Vint platform are speculative and involve substantial risks to consider before investing. We may provide communication that may contain certain forward-looking statements that are subject to various risks and uncertainties. Information provided in any communications, including this podcast, is not legal, business, or tax advice. All prospective investors should consult a legal, tax, or business advisor concerning the subject matter of any communications and any offering.